Greetings from the Asian Productivity Organization. Welcome to all viewers to this APO's Productivity Talk, a series of discussions on the topics related to productivity. We are now broadcasting this event live from Tokyo. Today, we will discuss the reason why small and medium-sized enterprises or SMEs needs to adopt a greener approach in their operation and in their business model. Although the individual environmental footprint of SMEs may be low, but since they constitute a vast majority of businesses in the economy, switching the gear toward a more sustainable approach will have an enormous aggregate impact to the economy in the form of perhaps sustainable growth and at the same time, a more productive economy. To discuss about the issue, uh, we are joined by Ms. Vulkan Murunt Sevekjov, Ms. Bulkant, a Mongolian by nationality, a consultant at the Asian uh, Development Bank, who is currently um, in charge of the project that aims to create a better air, air quality standards for healthier and more livable cities across Asia. She is also a development practitioner with 15 years long of experience working and implementing projects in the area of climate change, clean energy, low carbon development, et cetera, et cetera. She is a former program leader with the Global Green Growth Institute and has also been involved in so many different projects related to inclusive green growth policy in collaboration with varieties of international organizations such as UNDP, World Bank, ILO, UNIDO, UNFCG, and many other. Before she will start with her sharing, I would like to inform to all viewers that today Chesent is interactive. I'm inviting all viewers to leave comments and questions in the live chat. So hi, Vulgant, how are you today? Uh, hello everyone from sunny Manila. I'm doing very good. You may now please start uh, with your sharing, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, as Mr. Arsione kindly introduced me, uh, my name is Bulgan Murun Tivikjav. For your convenience of easier pronunciation, please call me in short Bulgan. Uh, I'm a development practitioner as uh, uh, was introduced. And in terms of profession, I do designing, conducting assessment and implementing projects and policies on areas of climate change, clean energy and environment. Basically, these are all a type of green intervention. In short, it is, uh, I do provide consultancy on low carbon development, uh, which is green uh, intervention. So we will be talking more about it in this, uh, my uh, slides. Uh, first of all, before starting the presentation, I would like to thank uh, the Asia Productivity Organization for kindly inviting me in this uh, talk. Uh, and to share my knowledge on green interventions in SMEs. And uh, I hope that participants will have an idea about green interventions. And hopefully at the end, I'm looking forward to hear from uh, experienced um, uh, environmental uh, SMEs in case if you happen to be in this uh, talk. So with this, please allow me to start my presentation. Uh, as uh, since I was introduced, uh, I, let me be uh, very uh, brief in this slide. I just uh, want to uh, highlight that prior to ADB, I had an opportunity to work uh, in the Philippines uh, while working at the Global uh, International Institute, uh, GGGI. There we had a very close collaboration with the Department of uh, Trade and Industry so please note that uh, most of the cases, the, those experiences I had with this particular project, especially the green interventions among SMEs will be um, briefly uh, shared in this uh, talk. Ulgan, uh, if I may interrupt, could you please share your PPT sure. while you are talking, please? Sure, uh, can you see the outline? We don't see it yet. Could you please share it again? Okay.
Can you see the slide? Um, not yet. Um, I think, can we just ah. share it from you if you would like us to do it for you? Sure, no problem. Sure, no problem. Yeah, I okay. can actually see the slide and the... Can you see now? Yes, we can see it now. Yeah. Okay, is it good? Yep. You may please continue then. Okay. Sure, thank you. Um, so now let me provide uh, you an overview of what we will be discovering uh, in this uh, uh, coming uh, few minutes. Firstly, I will be providing you a uh, rational and background why in this uh, today's world we uh, need to have a green and what are the main reasons we have to uh, become more green in what we uh, do in terms of businesses. And secondly, I'll be uh, walking you through a methodology for green intervention applied for assessing uh, SMEs in terms of their level of greening. After that, uh, we'll uh, present some of the interesting case experiences from uh, countries uh, like Philippines. In addition, I will be also sharing cases from uh, Mongolia and uh, Fiji. And I hope... Uh, at the end, we will discuss main findings and lessons learned on potential benefits of uh, green interventions. And uh, finally, I hope we will have an interactive discussion. I'll expect some question and answers a session. Hopefully looking forward to hear from you. Can you see the next slide? So one of the main reasons why we often these days talk about the need to be green is that uh, we live in a world that has uh, limited resources and our population is growing much higher speed in uh, comparison to the diminishing degree of uh, the planet's own restorative capacity. And due to this uh, rapid growth, uh, we are facing an ecological overshoot, uh, we can say. And according to the world, um, Ecological Footprint uh, Agency, by 2030, the world would need two planets uh, to provide us necessary resources. So to address the issue of climate change and to minimize uh, the uh, impacts, the ecological footprints, the countries uh, agreed a number of international agreements and uh, conventions. So here, I would like to mention the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate uh, Change and 2015 Paris Agreement and the famous Sustainable Development Goals. So all these conventions and agreements somehow uh, are giving uh, one message to us, uh, which is we have to come, uh, there's a high need to become green. So with this, uh, we have to question ourselves, so what do we mean by uh, green intervention? And uh, uh, here, um, in the context of SMEs for this uh, talk, uh, I'll refer as uh, green interventions uh, or practices can be defined in uh, all activities that uh, are actually aimed at sustainable processes of uh, manufacturing and using uh, optimally use of uh, energy, other resources such as raw materials, water, and uh, other uh, handling of pollutants. So uh, we will be focusing on these uh, resources, how SMEs uh, are doing green. So uh, as you might uh, uh, know that roles and actions of SMEs are enormous in uh, building a sustainable world. Uh, as a group all together, um, MSMEs uh, play a huge role in global uh, economy, particularly equitable income generation, uh, employment uh, generation. So according to the World Bank, um, globally altogether, SMEs represent 90% of uh, businesses and more than 50% of labor force. And they all together contribute up to uh, 40% of national income. And this figure uh, in Asia, for example, goes even higher. And out of 
uh, for example, 10 jobs, uh, seven are created by SMEs. So that's why SMEs uh, have the power of uh, uh, to develop profitable businesses and models that are inclusive to creation of good and quality jobs uh, and fair supply uh, chains. And uh, so there is a challenge, uh, however, um, in going green. One of the main challenges is that uh, many uh, SNEs or uh, the predominant perception are saying that uh, it is too expensive to become green. There are uh, associated high costs. So, so that is the main challenge about um, perception. So the question is, is it uh, true? And this is precisely, uh, precisely what, uh, how we started our project in the Philippines. And uh, when we had our first uh, consultation with the governments, uh, for example, uh, that, the, that the mindset among the private sectors was that uh, it's very uh, expensive and this is something very um, far away for the uh, small and medium enterprises. So these are uh, these, uh, uh, the three guiding questions we wanted to address to raise public awareness around the green. So, First of all, uh, whether greening has potential benefits? Uh, if yes, then what are those in terms of monetary values and non-monetary values? And secondly, we wanted to uh, have a very easy uh, assessment methodology so we can identify various uh, types of green practices and also categorize their, in terms of their uh, types of greening. And thirdly, once we apply those methodologies in SMEs, we wanted to learn what are the common uh, practices and uh, green intervention that we can also uh, scale up in other countries. So with that, uh, we proceeded with the project. And as part of our research uh, methodology formulation initially, we started a two-step selection method um, as an initial assessment. In the first step, we, want, uh, we went through a large number of companies and did preliminary screening, uh, which resulted in the shortlisting of companies that uh, would fit under the uh, scope and focus of our study. Then secondly, uh, during the second step, we conducted activities ranging from assessing the survey doing field visits and interviewing agreed uh, business owners to gather in more uh, in-depth information. And I must acknowledge that in addition uh, of this, uh, we had to have various consultations, including national and sub-national government officials, other project uh, implementers to have more uh, holistic uh, view and local circumstances. And, uh, once we had this um, gather a uh, number of uh, initiatives uh, of SMEs applying various screening practices in their businesses, we wanted to uh, categorize their level and type of uh, greening interventions. So as you can see in this assessment methodology diagram, uh, there are three levels of interventions so far we uh, come up and uh, it's from, to explain from the bottom of a level one to us, uh, uh, this is some kind of intervention or activity that has uh, no uh, monetary investment at all, but uh, simply uh, by way of changing a certain mindset and behavior that was resulted in a very interesting uh, benefit. We'll talk about it later. And secondly, uh, what we call a low investment or level two, uh, means uh, for SMEs uh, that uh, did uh, very affordable purchases uh, and uh, did some uh, interventions in terms of uh, different, a little bit higher. Uh, it somehow involved investment, but it uh, purchase or procurement or intervention was uh, affordable. And the last, uh, which is high investment, the level three, which uh, we categorize, somehow involve uh, the high cost. Uh, the technological solutions that company uh, inter, um, introduced in their uh, processing, the producing and manufacturing uh, facilities. And uh, now the question is, uh, in that case, how uh, the energy 
and other resources were utilized in each level. So in terms of uh, the level one, uh, since I mentioned there was no cost at all involved, this was practices related to monitoring of electricity bill. So it was a very good start for companies to look at their fuel consumption or measuring their electricity bill to start with the energy saving program. And uh, second level was mostly uh, energy efficient measures ranging from uh, replacing changing so it's more of an affordable type of interventions that uh, the companies uh, did in their own and the most uh, the last uh, the level which is three it involved the uh, use of energy efficient equipment mostly uh, purchasing a uh, different type of equipment um, such as uh, motion sensing light so it was more of innovative but also uh, high investment technologies that they produced and uh, so aside from energy, there are waste-related uh, 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 interventions. For example, starting from the last, uh, the high investment, the level three, uh, there were mostly biomass power generation that produces the byproducts uh, into the uh, manufacturing facility. And in the middle level, which is two, uh, they used uh, the waste in a way more innovative approach, like recycling into byproducts. Uh, to become more aware about their social and environmental uh, development. And those, uh, the level one, no investment uh, levels, uh, they actually did uh, more of a monitoring and improving their waste production to find uh, uh, more uh, practical solutions uh, instead of just disposing the waste. And uh, so apart from waste and energy, uh, the most uh, SMEs, they have to consume uh, somehow uh, the water. Uh, water is um, quite costly in uh, SMEs. So there are lots of interesting innovations around uh, wastewater, reuse of wastewater, water saving uh, equipments. If I talk about the no investment, like it's mostly uh, water measurement and uh, sometimes the uh, companies had to detect where their leakage is coming from. So just repairing was uh, very good in terms of uh, water saving. But then when you go to higher level, like uh, two and second, then there were a lot of innovative uh, cases, uh, for example, wa wastewater treatment, and they also collected the rain during the rainy season. So let's then now go to the companies, what uh, kind of examples they can uh, share here. So in this slide, uh, you can see this is one of the companies in the Philippines uh, and uh, very indeed uh, they uh, make uh, out of this uh, nut uh, interesting, the delicious uh, pastries and sweet products. And in this company, as you can see, um, mostly in the left uh, uh, bottom, the, they used uh, mostly energy efficient measures, for example, replacing of LED lights uh, to have more uh, savings from their energy bill. And now the another company here, uh, interesting uh, case is that this company is called Free Food Coconut, uh, which produces coconut sugar and chocolate bars. Uh, the, so they took a very innovative approach instead of um, using centrally distributed water, they used rainwater uh, by introducing rainwater harvesting uh, technology and they did a lot of water saving. So uh, that was an interesting uh, case. Now the last uh, interesting, another next company here you see is uh, the, they produce banana chips and distribute in supermarkets and various exhibitions. So what they did uh, was that uh, reusing of uh, discarded banana peels. As you can see, uh, there are lots of waste um, that uh, come from this um, facility. And instead of throwing them, uh, they just uh, turn this into organic fertilizers and they also produce byproduct uh, to farm animals. So that was a very good example of reusing the waste in this uh, case. So, 
overall, let's uh, see what happens in the Philippines. What are the main uh, trends? Uh, and uh, so I showed here only three representative like company cases uh, that we're doing a green intervention. And in this slide, as you can see, a main uh, common uh, practice of green in all these companies um, like waste, there was the major intervention they did. As you can see in this pie chart in blue, waste um, uh, constituted 40% of all the activities. So most screening intervention were around waste. Uh, and after waste um, management, uh, energy saving uh, or energy efficiency measures were the second after that. And that occupied almost more than 30% of uh, the green interventions we talked about. And after energy, water uh, was another interesting case where they introduced various water uh, conserving, uh, saving um, practices. And the least, uh, which is very minimal, but uh, uh, the no, uh, mentioning of the emissions was interesting, but uh, like calculating really the greenhouse gas emissions was very interesting, but it was quite rare. So I can see that there could be a potential opportunity in the future in the management of greenhouse gases. Uh, now, uh, if you look at these uh, levels uh, in terms of um, uh, greening interventions, so all this like here, 39 um, uh, cases. So. Like a majority of these SMEs, maybe it's because of their size, uh, mostly they did affordable purchases, uh, and uh, which means low investment. So that constituted majority of the uh, green interventions, which here like 21%. And the other uh, levels, like level one, which uh, had no cost, but then more of a change of mindset and high investment, which uh, included high technological solutions. Uh, 15% in this um, uh, case, uh, the Philippines case, uh, which we focus on food processing. So now please uh, allow me to proceed to the next interesting case, which is um, Fiji. As Fiji has become increasingly, uh, um, increasingly aware about the ocean, as you know, Fiji is surrounded by ocean and uh, the ocean uh, lately has been polluted by plastic uh, waste. And this company, uh, which is uh, very interesting, uh, they introduced a very traditional way of doing business. And uh, they displaced the disposable plastic bags with uh, their own uh, byproduct, the mix of beads, wax, oils, to use for a reusable uh, the covering for food uh, so basically, instead of uh, plastic bags, they had introduced various uh, the packaging materials. So that was a very excellent case from Fiji that addressed the uh, uh, issues around ocean uh, uh, waste. Yeah. And now I am coming to the uh, next, the last country case, which is uh, from Mongolia, where I grew up. So uh, in Mongolia, because of climate change and many other factors, uh, the land is very susceptible to degradation because of animal husbandry. Um, you know, overgrazing uh, is uh, the main, uh, the pasture land overgrazing became the major environmental uh, issue. So here in this picture, you can see a pack of goat grazing the land. So one of the reasons why uh, uh, the, the herders, uh, because of the high economic value of cashmere, uh, which is the fine wool uh, that is extracted from goat, many herders in Mongolia prefer to raise more goats than other animals, such as sheep, uh, cow, and horses. So during the last couple of decades, as you can see in this number, number of goats increased five times from 1990s till now and other animals like uh, horses and cows only two times so as you can see there's economic connection uh, of uh, the and then uh, business uh, with uh, in reference to the environment so 
what uh, interesting ca case can we share uh, for uh, from Mongolia? So, to address this kind of uh, challenges like uh, pasture land grazing, there were many activities and efforts initiated by international NGOs and other agencies, and among them is um, uh, Asia Development Bank's uh, project on sustainability planning with green supply chain management. And um, in this picture, you can see the, uh, a lady wearing a cashmere garment uh, and the brand is very famous. The company's main business is producing high-end cashmere uh, garments and sell nationwide stores also mainly these products go exported around the world. So one of the ADB projects, um, they did uh, assessment on environmental sustainability and recommended uh, 4P sustainability uh, strategy, uh, what we uh, used to call uh, products and design. Secondly, uh, goes about product production and people and profits. So let's uh, take a close look uh, the next slide. So, uh, as I mentioned at the grassroots level, uh, the company started uh, to address firstly the, uh, the land uh, issue. So, what they did is the company started sustainable procurement process by closely collaborating with the herders. So, these herders uh, who would sell their raw cashmere would need to be responsible for sustainably managing their land. So there's a guarantee that uh, they will sell their uh, raw materials, the cashmere to the company. So that's how there was a management uh, program to work closely with the um, herders and community. And secondly, in terms of uh, production process, uh, the company, like uh, other uh, companies I uh, mentioned, they did a lot of uh, resource saving uh, technologies, uh, introduction of energy efficient measures, water saving and proper discharge, uh, uh, discharge uh, practices in the factory. Uh, so that was an interesting case. So aside uh, from uh, like production and uh, you know, uh, the design, they also started to uh, take care of their staff, uh, their laborers. Uh, in terms of the people management. So there were very interesting cases uh, that they have um, towards their staff uh, and labor. Uh, for example, there is an injury prevention and rehabilitation program. So basically they are uh, take, uh, they're introducing health and well-being uh, program. So that motivates the company workers to continue work uh, for the uh, company for long term. And plus, they were conducting uh, continuous training and development and engagement with the community. So I'm uh, now coming to the main findings uh, of the, uh, this talk. As uh, we uh, wrap up, uh, at the end of uh, this, uh, what did we learn? Uh, the, uh, the question that I posed in the beginning, uh, like to reflect on that, we realized that um, green practice is actually in fact uh, pro profitable. The common perception was that it's quite uh, costly, but then uh, we in fact demonstrated in terms of costs that it can bring both monetary and non-monetary benefits. So green intervention does not always uh, require large financial investment. In fact, it can be a more of a mindset change innovative solutions and using of uh, local resources. Uh, another point is that if measured uh, well, greening is profitable uh, considering uh, the environmental and uh, social benefits they can uh, bring. And in terms of uh, globally, green SMEs can contribute to the global agenda on sustainable development if uh, all together uh, combined all these efforts. So on the uh, right side, you can see that uh, one of these uh, SDG agendas, uh, Decent Work and Economic Growth, which is SDG number eight, and Responsible Consumption and Production, which is uh, the 
uh, SDG number 12. So this is very beneficial in terms of global accumulated uh, SMEs if they all become uh, green. And uh, to continue the uh, main findings uh, and conclusions and benefits, uh, for example, in the Asia, especially in the Philippines, uh, because agriculture dependent businesses, we can see that uh, green practices among SMEs were in areas of waste uh, management and efficient use of water. And also an important aspect was a, a leadership role uh, was very much important. So uh, that was quite interesting to learn because of the leadership uh, and good vision, somehow they were influenced uh, to take a good action towards their environment. And plus, uh, because of their nature of uh, business, they somehow learned the value of becoming green. That's gradually uh, involved with certified organic markets, such as fair trade, that requires local hiring, and were often involved as skills at training uh, sessions and other innovative uh, programs. So now I'm coming to my uh, last uh, slide. Finally, at this uh, uh, end of this presentation, I wanted to kind of wrap up and I'd like to share this final slide to show a difference between uh, what I'm uh, on of green intervention versus uh, traditional way of uh, developing uh, the like way of doing business. And so-called, uh, for example, on this left side, you can see the linear model where uh, we usually used to do business uh, was that once you extract um, the resources, uh, then you make a pro production and then just dispose. So that is the uh, business as usual, the traditional way of doing a business, which is called linear model. But then the benefit of uh, this um, green intervention, which is part of the circular, circular model, uh, in contrast, as you can see, it's more of a circular uh, and green, which, is the, uh, which urges us to become more innovative in handling uh, the waste, to be more smart in the way we use resources. Uh, so less waste and more productivity at the end. Thank you very much for your attention. So this is uh, my uh, presentation and I'm very happy to discuss with you further. And in this last slide, you can see all the references um, I uh, use for preparing this uh, knowledge sharing talk. So thanks for your sharing, uh, Vulcan. Really appreciate it. I think we have learned some lessons there. I would like also once again to invite the viewers, particularly for those countries that you have been presented in your project, the Philippines, Fiji, and Mongolia. If you have any question, if you have any practical question whatsoever, please um, uh, post it here in our live chat. But while waiting for the question from our viewers, um, let, let, let's just have this um, Kind of one on one discussion between you and me, Bulgan. If you, oh, you know, would like me to, um, you know, to to direct the discussion toward the, that that direction, mm -hmm. is that based on your experience, what is it the hindrance or the things that is blocking the adoption of, you know, green practices for SMEs? So you mentioned about the perception about the cost, right? and also perhaps the um, perception mm. of the return on the investment. In fact, you also mentioned that, you know, at level one, basically you don't need to invest any money at all, but what you need is just to change the mindset mm. of the behavior. What, what was is it, what was is it the, the biggest sort of um, blocking for adopting green practices? Thank you, uh, Mr. Arsiani. I think in fact, it's very interesting and important question, yeah. So this hindrance, uh, the common challenge uh, based on our experience, it's uh, more of a, both a strong environmental awareness and cost of investment issues. So from our study, like a majority of SMEs, uh, like the pioneers, the champions were highly environment conscious and inclined to produce sustainable products such as healthy and organic. So 
as I was mentioning, uh, the leadership was playing a very important role. So one of the enterprises had a very um, interesting business slogan, which says, uh, I'm just uh, quoting, what is good for farmers is good for the earth and therefore good for society and the future. So uh, there was an incentive for the farmers also the mindset was really to do something good for the environment because you know they're using the resources and for sustain their livelihood they have to really um, uh, be environmentally friendly but then of course uh, the second concern is as you said uncertainty about the investment uh, because uh, SMEs uh, generally has limited financial resources uh, they face uh, with issue of investment trade-offs uh, whether their small investment can generate uh, greater value. In this regard, it is very important to <clears throat> showcase uh, real examples, uh, like that's what we learned, that green investments are profitable and it can have high return from uh, greater savings. Uh, uh, so uh, that's precisely the objective of our study uh, CAM uh, uh, in that time. And uh, we also try to convince or like through our reports and uh, consultations, we they, basically SMEs, we work together, they realize that returns can be collected on both cost savings and increased value of pro product. For example, once they gradually become more green, uh, their business become uh, like more competitive. And then they will become part of the fair trade, like EU, uh, European uh, Union standards. So they had more advantages um, opportunity so gradually that was uh, you know the uh, like experience for those smes but uh, that hindrances gradually could be overcome thank you bulgan uh, this is a question from the philippine i believe joseph herrera mm -hmm. um, the person is actually asking about who conducted the survey and assessment in the philippine I think the person is referring to the project that you were uh, presenting in the Philippines. There are, I believe, um, three projects. Could you please explain more about that? Sure. Thank you for a very interesting question. Um, so you're uh, asking about the survey who conducted. So uh, to be precise about this study, as I mentioned, uh, it was uh, part of my uh, work with the Department of Trade and Industry in the Philippines. So we closely worked with this uh, uh, government uh, institute. Uh, in terms of doing a survey and conceptualizing, we worked closely with the uh, local NGO called uh, ASSIST at that time. And uh, we also worked closely with the local uh, Department of Trade and Industry colleagues whom we um, exchanged views and got uh, collaborated. So you can also find uh, in the website, I'll be happy to share the details, uh, the full report available. Thank you. Another question from our uh, colleague from Mongolia, Ms. Badbilek Sagant. She's basically um, asking for clarification that changing from linear the circular model of economy, it may be perceived as difficult by most of SMEs. Mm. Then she is thinking that at the initial level, perhaps the SME needs to have a really firm support, perhaps from the government, from perhaps international donors. Do you share mm. a similar agreement like what Ms. Petlak is sharing here? Yes, uh, precisely. I um, uh, I agree hundred percent. It's uh, initially for any like SMEs, since their scope and size is uh, within like livelihood, a small size, uh, they don't have the same uh, capacity or investment that big, uh, larger companies have. So we learned that uh, in the beginning, it's very important to provide some sort of assistance. So that's uh, the general, I think, in most of the developing countries. Usually it is like NGO, international uh, like donor agencies that uh, uh, work together with the government or uh, directly with the locals to initially have this kind of project. So firstly, that was an interesting observation. Uh, I, I agree. 
you need to have a um, like uh, you have to have a close collaboration and help where uh, they are lacking this could be also a kind of perception or they might not know or understand the concept behind the green once they understand if some project for example addresses that then uh, they become actually uh, it is quite quick they start to uh, like take measures and then the businesses could uh, like uh, there are cases that in the philippines for example there are uh, like uh, smes that started to export their products to european countries so that was the quite uh, impressive result we could see thank you uh, let me just continue th that question, that particular question with the idea of adopting green practices. If, if it is true that SMEs mainly support at its initial level of adoption, so the idea has to be generated from the external of the organization or has to be kind of like you know, that can be, you know, generated internally because of the challenge, because of the need perhaps, and then perhaps the external international donor or government can also support. I'm, I'm just trying to relate the previous question with the, the, the ideas. How, how is it your your general observ observation about the the idea to, to adopt a green practice? Was, was it, you know, mostly coming from the SMEs um, mm. internally or something that is imposed you know, externally. If you could mm. clarify that point, please, for us. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, very uh, interesting. Also, important aspect that you're touching is this idea for adopting green practices coming internally or externally something. So this can be, uh, you know, both uh, case. Sometimes you need to have some kind of external assistance so the people can be more aware of what's going on you have to give the uh, the push on that case. But there are also factors where SMEs themselves, they realize, because they once they have this ambition to grow and compete in international, or at least within their local like community, they somehow like uh, start towards that direction. So um, in our case, for example, when we were doing assessment, you know, we were trying to identify the best uh, cases so something must have gone before we like entered. And uh, for example, in the Philippines, for example, prior to uh, like assessment, there have been lots of knowledge sharing, showcasing, or uh, there were some financial support even uh, were introduced by organizations like um, GIZ uh, and promoting the green growth. So if, uh, so point I wanted to make here is that if the idea since in this case, uh, the concept of green was relatively new. There were like perception, the hindrance was that people did not understand, like they had uh, idea that this is some something very uh, like expensive. But once you work with them and show them, okay, you see, you don't need to have much uh, like expenses in this level, uh, like you can be like that level. And gradually uh, like SMEs were more motivated to become green or adopt this kind of new practices when they learn uh, from other SMEs that become a gradually uh, green. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks, Vulgant, once again, really great answer that you are giving to us. Um, let me just ask you a really short question. Like in the case of SMEs, for example, by going greener, can we also say that we are becoming more innovative at the same time? Mm, yeah, so yeah, actually, uh, I think this is the one uh, like thing, uh, like when you say we are becoming green, it's also about um, being innovative and in what we do. In other words, becoming greener does uh, hand in hand uh, with becoming more innovative. So I like to answer your question briefly, yes, I can say the green practices or sustainability principles make SMEs more innovative. Uh, I can just briefly share uh, like two examples here. Like first, uh, since SMEs are very cost conscious and cannot invest in large uh, green technologies as they can be pricey. In this regard, they start searching uh, for low cost and local technologies. 
after harvesting. So they don't just purchase some like expensive equipment, but they just start to doing on their own, like um, best use of uh, heat and have to reuse their waste. So it's more of a, their own innovative ways of doing it. But sometimes the regulations or policy, the, because of the government, they might impose that uh, like restrictions, like for uh, introduce some kind of energy efficient measures. So it's kind of interesting they become more innovative Uh, second example, as uh, I was introducing in Fiji example, for example, they innovated new product, honeybee byproduct can be future of SMEs. So uh, like problem created them uh, to be more innovative to solve that problem, like plastics, uh, which are uh, like polluting the ocean, that led uh, the SMEs uh, in Fiji to think about uh, their future, like uh, fishing and all this, uh, the health of the ecosystem, they will uh, somehow affect their businesses negatively, right? So that's kind of a connection and reflection somehow I could observe in this, um, the path for the SMEs to become uh, uh, green as much as possible. So yes, it, uh, they really uh, go hand in hand, uh, the green and innovative. Allow me to take, um Another question from our viewers. This is from Bangladesh, Mr. Muhammad Nazir Ahmad Mia, I believe. So he's asking basically, what are the relevant of, you know, kind of the standardization in here, like such as ISO standard, or we have also EMS being put mm. in place. So the adoption of green practices in SMEs can also be, uh, you know, relying on these standards. Your view, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. This is very also a good question because uh, there are internationally already um, uh, established standards to protect the environment, to introduce in the businesses. I remember ISO 14,000, 5,000 in, uh, energy management. So this also uh, can be a very good the standard package that companies, any company can uh, like apply uh, for that. So they can be certified like ISO standards. But in our case, for example, the MSMEs, like it's more of a micro, small and medium enterprises that have a bit of um, human resource uh, challenge. So they usually start uh, with the help of uh, external uh, sources like uh, NGO kind of training programs. And gradually, I think um, once they grow and they have some successful cases, I think they will become somehow ready to adopt that uh, standards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question that I have perhaps is about, you have shared with us the successful stories, some projects that you have been implemented or you have, you know, you have known that others, in, you know, have been implementing it. And uh, they, they are, perhaps they are becoming a successful company now by adopting mm -hmm. green practices. Is there any kind of demonstration effect, meaning that those particular successful company, they bring example and then they kind of guide or consult other SMEs that's not yet in the journey toward mm. greener SMEs. Could you please share mm. your experience about it, mm -hmm. please? Sure, yes. I'm very happy to share an uh, example, like uh, uh, since uh, the Philippines was very uh, like in-depth experience and interesting. Uh, for example, as I mentioned in our study, for example, there were lots of different uh, like sectors and industries, uh, the industry clusters, for example, the garments, uh, a shoe and uh, furniture. So our starting point was uh, the food processing sector. That was the scope. But then once we uh, uh, invite our SMEs and uh, who did the championing of green, 
when we invite them in the workshops and introduce about them and when they uh, display their products and share their experiences in international or national uh, like SME events, then gradually um, I see the power, the demonstration effect uh, uh, that uh, give to other like industries. Like if we really want to have the similar, can we do the similar like greening in other industries? So I think uh, it's really showed a multiplier effect. And I think there are like uh, very interesting uh, like cases that uh, led them to also like many other SMEs, for example, in this case, uh, we only like uh, focused on food processing industry, but already when we were uh, like doing a sh uh, demonstration of sharing our examples in different events, already other uh, like SMEs were asking. And I think uh, Department of Trade and Industry the, um, itself, they organized very interesting uh, fair exhibitions. Uh, so that was very good effect, I could see. Thank you. Um, you also mentioned in your presentation the relation between becoming more sustainable and then at the same time, it will also create the employment. You also highlight that there is this perhaps a relatively strong relation between um, you know, adopting green practices and uh, embracing like, you know, more female labor work workforce, for example. Can you please mm -hmm. highlight a little bit or elaborate more on the effect of you know going green for SMEs and then it 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 it's it, uh, its impact toward employment and also perhaps mm -hmm. employment for the you know sort of marginalized people in the society? Yes, uh, yeah, it's very important. In fact, the marginalized society or inclusiveness approach. Uh, in the talk, uh, I was mainly focusing uh, to share on resources that we uh, that becoming like used by SMEs. But uh, as we uh, go and uh, go deeper in our studies, we realized that um, SMEs somehow uh, have been cooperating with the local communities and people uh, as their uh, like suppliers, because hiring locally helped them to retain workers a long time and also contribute into the livelihood of their own communities. So for example, um, they supported indigenous tribes and farmers in their areas. So then those, uh, they become more motivated uh, to not like migrate to our city, they stay and then protect and uh, stay in the farm. And then uh, like that were like in uh, coffee, cacao, like, uh, like that kind of industry in SMEs because since they are farmers, they want to like stay. And if there's an income sustainable, they're willing to work. So there are lots of cases to partner with the local indigenous uh, groups uh, within that field because for the SMEs, they need to have like continuous supply chain. On the other hand, for the farmers, they want to be continuously employment, employed. So uh, that was quite, uh, quite interesting, the relationship mm. Uh, for the enterprises uh, when they were growing. So they, they become more capable of taking care of the environment and community they were inside uh, within uh, that uh, like local area. So definitely uh, there were best cases where like um, they had a very good uh, community program, continuous like training for the locals because as you can uh, imagine uh, like farmers, they don't ha have this proper like uh, licensed education or diploma, but then they've been living in the land for their generation. So sometimes you have to provide some kind of uh, like training on how does this solar uh, like panel work. So once they have this practical like uh, training, they become very much motivated and uh, want to stay uh, like long uh, for this uh, supply chain. Thank you. This is perhaps the last question before we end up the session. I hope that we can continue longer, but the time is limited for us. So uh, let me just touch upon on the role of government. This is also the point raised by our colleague again, Ms. Bat Bilek Sagan from Mongolian Productivity Organization. So if you could tell us some best practices, you know, government policy, government intervention, 
in promoting, let's say, green productivity or green practices um, in the SMEs. I believe that you have worked a lot with the government. I, I, I can see from your CV that you have this really long engagement working on the policy level. If you could share us about the best practices, you know, again, government intervention, government policy, that would be great for all of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. The last question, indeed, it's very important. Uh, the role of government, I see, also plays a very important factor in promoting the sustainable way of doing businesses. So I'm just thinking what would be a good example to share here, like example where the government really help it uh, to promote. Uh, mm. So this could be, since the question was provided from Mongolia, Mr. Batvidvik, so maybe I can just take one example from Mongolia, but um, in a different uh, like context. For example, I think in Mongolia, there were some uh, policy uh, to uh, like, you know, in Mongolia and other uh, developing countries, there are lots of um, like secondhand cars and vehicles were used uh, like, uh, and that was actually creating pollution in the road. And so there were like government introduced um, like uh, the scheme incentive mechanism where if uh, um, someone buys uh, like new car, which is hybrid, then there will not be any tax imposed to this. And there will be no restrictions in the road for driving the hybrid car. So basically you are driving a new car, so their engine will, will not pollute uh, as much as uh, the same as uh, the secondhand vehicles that emit and pollute uh, the air. So that was quite successful. And I remember doing myself a, a case research, the number of hybrid new cars uh, uh, in Mongolia increased dramatically. And that was because of the income uh, the incentive that uh, the government provided. So this could be one example uh, I can share so far. So like, uh, I hope that gradually uh, there will be more like uh, incentives uh, to uh, have more like uh, efficient or uh, like technology solutions that can SMEs do. I think there are many other examples, uh, uh, yeah, that government also uh, like, like restricts in a way more polluting uh, kind of businesses by putting some kind of restrictive measures like less polluting uh, these kind of chemicals or or then uh, they try to promote those are becoming uh, green. So thank you. I'm, I'm afraid that we are now at the end of this talk. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to express our gratitude to you Ms. Bulgan Murun Sevakjaf, a um, consultant from mm -hmm. the Asian Development Bank, for sharing your time and experience with us. Really appreciate it. Hopefully that we can have another session um, in the near future. I would like also to thank the viewers for their engagement. If you still have comments and questions, please leave them on our YouTube channel and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we could. I believe that and I'm sure that Ms. Bulgant will be very happy to provide us with her answer on your question. Um, if you like also to receive updates on the future productivity talk or any other updates related to APO, please subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. With that, I would like to wish everyone and Ms. Bulgant to stay safe and productive. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye.